Super. We're going to wait another two minutes uh, just to let people make their way into here. By the way, if you're going to be trying this at home, uh, I recommend a blog post I wrote over the weekend that kind of goes through step by step and uh, has the prerequisites for what you'd, you'd be needing to do to replicate what we're going to do today. Uh, it's available at our, our blog. If you go to gridcentric.com slash blog, it's just the uh, most recent entry. Also, this is apparently an hour and a half long workshop, uh, so we got plenty of time. We're gonna see if we make it the uh, the whole hour and a half, but uh, we'll probably try and wrap up before lunchtime. Uh, since we have so much time, if you if anybody has any questions, you can just uh, kind of shout them out or walk up to the microphone in the center of the room and uh, and ask them. Hi to Eric. Absolutely. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the, the, uh, well, the, the subject of this talk is Windows on OpenStack, running Windows on OpenStack, and kind of what are the things that can go wrong, and, and uh, you know, hopefully identify some ways that uh, you can avoid some of the pitfalls and, uh, and run, run Windows with, uh, with ease and efficiency. First, a bit about me. I'm, I'm Tim Smith. I'm one of the co-founders and head of product at a company called Gridcentric. Uh, we've, uh, we just turned four this month, and I've spent the last four years uh, heading up product development there uh, and engineering. Uh, I usually get tasked with, the, uh, with doing our Windows deployments and POCs for, for customers, so I, I probably have the most experience in the company uh, running Windows on OpenStack. Uh, and you know, I guess we'll just get, get started. So the, the talk again is about running Windows on top of OpenStack. Uh, there, there are some folks that, uh, that are specializing in running OpenStack on top of Hyper-V, running OpenStack on top of Windows. This talk is more about the other direction of running Windows desktops and Windows servers on top of an OpenStack environment. Uh, for this talk, we're going to assume that the OpenStack environment is based on KVM. Uh, so, you know, the, there are probably a lot of differences between running Windows on OpenStack on Windows. We're not going to cover those today. We're going to we're going to assume you're just working with a kind of uh, bread and butter OpenStack distribution on top of on top of Linux on top of KVM. We're going to go through a number of topics, and as we're going through these, I'm going to I'm going to kick off a an actual Windows install, which will hopefully uh, hopefully work and hopefully finish by the time the end of this talk is done. Uh, and we're going to use that as kind of a, a framework to uh, go through the different decisions and different things you need to think about as you're running Windows on OpenStack. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're looking at getting is that when you you know when you type Nova Image List, you have your Windows image in glance, uh, ready to be booted up and ready to be run. <clears throat> uh, so I'm, I'm going to kick off at the, at the very beginning just the basics of, of bringing Windows into an OpenStack environment. Uh, the first thing you need to do is actually install Windows because there's no, uh, there's really not publicly available glance ready images for Windows. Uh, I, I have been informed by the, the cloud-based folks who are kind of experts on, uh, on a lot of things Windows-related uh, and, and cloud-related that they have just now released and given permission by Microsoft to release uh, Windows Image uh, that you can import directly into Glance. But uh, assuming you're not using that, 
you have to go through this kind of install process where you start off with the Windows ISO and uh, kind of move your way towards an actual disk image that you can then shove into Glance. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick that off now, kind of in the background. I mentioned we have a, a, blog, pro, a, a blog post that goes through the step-by-step -step, uh, things we're going to do to create this. And I'm just going to kind of go ahead and start running through these. Uh, one of the things that's important to kind of recognize is that you can't currently easily attach a CD, uh, an ISO image to a Nova instance as you're booting it. I understand this is something that's being worked on, uh, but, but uh, in the meantime, we actually have to have access to a physical compute node uh, that's similar to whatever physical compute nodes we're going to be running Windows on. Eventually, specifically, the CPUs need to be uh, similar or, or uh, the, uh, the exact same. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is just create a uh, QCOW2 image. And this is, a, this is a file that acts as kind of a virtual hard drive. Uh, and I'm going to give it a lot of space. Typically, maybe your, your, your Linux instances, you might, uh, you might typically be sizing them in the, in the 10 gigabyte, 15 gigabyte range. But for Windows and for a Windows install, you, you usually need uh, significantly more. Um, I'm going to make it 30 gigabytes large and that operations really quickly because all it does is create a small little file that looks like a 30 gig hard drive. The, uh, the next step I'm going to do is actually boot a uh, virtual machine that is going to uh, have that empty hard drive as its uh, that, that hard drive file as its hard drive, as its kind of C drive. And we're also going to plug in as CD-ROMs, the Windows install CD-ROM, and another uh, CD, the Windows install CD, and another CD that holds uh, what are called para-virtualized drivers. So I'm just going to kick that off. <clears throat> the, uh, the importance of that para-virtualized driver bit is that uh, when you when you boot a VM, Windows doesn't know that it's operating in a virtualized environment. And so if you just, uh, if you just emulate your, your hard drive and your network cards, you're going to end up with really, really slow performance. So we kind of, in order to make this boot process go faster and ultimately in order to make the runtime performance go faster, uh, we're going to be using these pair of virtualized drivers. But because we want that at boot time, we need to actually plug in that second CD and uh, and use those drivers to boot. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just VNC into that. That VM as it's uh, as it's coming up. And you know if you've installed Windows, you're kind of familiar with this screen. So what what we're going to do for for this workshop, I'm going to go through these first steps, and then it's going to go into that phase where it's installing everything and that's going to take a, take a while, so we'll just jump back to uh, covering the concepts at that point. <clears throat> One of the first things that Windows is going to want to do when it's, when it's installing is ask you where you want to install to. And at this point in the install process, because we're, we're using that para-virtualized storage device, uh, Windows doesn't know how to talk to it quite. So one of the first things we're going to have to do is actually uh, go into that CD and give it the appropriate drivers. And again, if there are any uh, if there are any questions at any point, you can go ahead and just shout them out. We're installing 64-bit Windows 7 for this this workshop. And we're going to pick the SCSI controller, which means the disk controller. And once that's loaded, Windows will be able to see that, uh, that pair of virtualized virtual hard drive that we created. And we can kind of kick off the rest of the process. While well, we're, uh, OK, there we go. So I'll just click Next. And then we begin this 
process of copying the files off the CD onto the hard drive and expanding them and so on. Uh, this is going to take a little while. So while that's going on, I'm going to switch back to uh, these concepts. <clears throat> uh, before I begin uh, that, uh, can I just ask the audience how many of you are running or how many of you have an OpenStack install right now? If you could just put your hands up. It looks like about half. How many have, have been able to run Windows or running Windows on OpenStack right now? And uh, how many of that, I guess we'll have, this will be two separate questions, which, uh, which um, fraction of you are running Windows as a desktop? Okay, so a few, just a few. Mostly server, then I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, one of the difference be, differences between running Windows in, in a cloud environment like OpenStack versus running it on just a, a kind of a bare hypervisor like, like uh, ESX or uh, KVM or Zen server is that the, the kind of provisioning model for VMs is different in a cloud environment. Uh, in, in a cloud environment, you kind of have this concept of a, a catalog of disk images that, uh, that you can then spin up multiple virtual machines from. Uh, whereas with a more traditional hypervisor, you typically have a kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio between disk images and VMs. And where that complicates things is that, uh, I mean, unless you want to have your catalog full of, you know, every single uh, of the uh, disk image for every single VM, you're going to want to be using, uh, you kind of need to create these disk images in a way that they're, they're kind of generalizable and uh, when you actually boot them up that you can actually customize them. Uh, there's a bit of customization that can go in uh, before you, you generalize them. Is anybody familiar with uh, the sysprep tool, right, and creating what they call answer files? So sysprep is, is this tool that'll take a, um, take a Windows install and kind of roll back the, the out-of-box stuff that's been done uh, to make it a kind of generalizable disk image that you can take and go and, and install on other machines. In our case, we're going to be taking it and installing it in other VMs. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that you can do with, with sysprep is, uh, is kind of customize the startup experience when you boot those machines for the first time. And the way you, you would typically do that is using something called uh, Microsoft System Image Manager, which I've got uh, loaded up here. And just to kind of give you an idea of, of some things you can do, uh, and, I, and it's probably, probably, you're probably not going to be able to see this from the screen, but you can uh, open up firewall ports. You can start services running like remote desktop. You can set the system language. You can set the time zone. You can create accounts. So you can do things kind of at this general stage that, uh, that are going to then happen as the machine's booted for the first time or the VM's booted for the first time. So the significance of that is that uh, there, there are two kind of use cases for running Windows on OpenStack. The one, one use case is as an operator, you want to you want to create Windows images uh, that your users can then boot up and and customize and uh, enter their own product keys, perhaps. Uh, but they're not going to be able to have actual control over, over uploading their own images into Glance and then using those. And for those cases, you, you do want to actually run through the, this uh, sysprep uh, procedure to, so that the images that you're putting into Glance are, don't have you know, your own customizations or don't have, they aren't, they're not specific to your organization because other organizations or other, other groups in your organization are going to be using them. Uh, and that's the that's the approach that we're going to be going through today. We'll just check up how we're doing there. Okay. Um, the the second use case is where you you as the user are, are kind of also the operator, or you do have some control over what you're able to put into Glance. Uh, in that case, uh, you know you probably don't want you probably want to perform customization on your images before. Uh, before they're put into Glance so that every time you boot a VM, they're kind of already customized. And for that, there's a pretty handy tool called Cloud Base Init, 
which kind of mirrors the functionality of uh, something called cloud init that's, that's typically installed in Linux virtual machines. Uh, so cloud-based init and cloud init, they both take advantage of something called the metadata service, which is something that runs in Nova, uh, that when a VM comes up, it's able to uh, go to, through HTTP to a, to a kind of special address and fetch information out like the admin password and the host name and so on. And it can also fetch out custom kind of boot time scripts that, uh, that, that you want to uh, give the VM to run. Uh, so this, this is, uh, you know, this is typically, if you're running in that second case, you want to have it so that uh, as you're booting your VMs, you want to be able to do some customization and you want them to get their own unique host names uh, and you want them to be able to uh, join domains, uh, join your Active Directory domain, and so on. Uh, you would use you would use something like cloud base in it. Are there any questions so far? Just check back on our Windows install. Okay, so we're probably getting getting to the point where we're actually going to do something there. Uh, so on that on that topic of these these dual use cases for running Windows in the in the cloud, uh, I'll touch a bit on on licensing, uh, licensing and license keys, and I I, I just want to clarify something ahead of time that uh, the the license and the key are are actually two separate things. The license is this agreement you've made with Microsoft that in exchange for for you know so many dollars you're able to run so many copies of Windows. Uh, the license key itself is is this digital fragment, this this string that you put into, uh, you know, that you enter into the the wizard, uh, that convinces the software that you actually have that license agreement with Microsoft. And there are really three types of keys. Uh, one is the, the the one that we're probably most familiar with if you're just a kind of a, a Windows user at home. Uh, you install Windows. You enter your price, your your license key off the uh, the uh, back of the manual, uh, and that's that's kind of a one one to one unique license key that uh, that says you're allowed to run one copy of Windows, and this is that copy. Uh, there's also something called a multiple all allocation key, which is similar to that, except uh, Microsoft servers will accept that license key multiple times uh, before before rejecting it. And finally, there's there's uh, what's called a volume license key, which is which is something that's kind of baked into a whole bunch of a special of special builds of Windows, uh, whereby you you say uh, I've got you know an agreement to run some some large number of Windows instances, and uh, and you there's infrastructure that you need to set up in your network to allow those those instances to come up and authenticate. Uh, and typically, the first two types of keys are going to actually reach out to Microsoft's uh, activation servers and do that activation. The third type of key uh, is something that would be in-house. Uh, you'd, you'd have your own key management server, it's called, that your, your VMs would be talking to directly. Uh, where, this, where licensing keys, license keys start to get a little bit messy in a virtualized environment is that if you're using one of the first two types of keys, uh, a lot of times, as you're creating multiple VMs with that same key baked in, um, you'll, uh, you know, over time, Windows will say, okay, the hardware has changed, the network devices have changed, things have changed, and I need to, re, uh, I need to reactivate. And in the, in the first case, you may, end up having your, uh, you may end up having that key not work. In the second case, you may end up driving your, your, uh, your allocation count up, your Mac count up. Uh, just a quick question for the audience: Has anybody has anybody had success using Max in a virtualized environment? No. Okay. We typically recommend that uh, our customers use volume licensing keys, just because uh, even if the VM decides it's it's its own unique thing and it needs to reactivate, uh, it can just reach out to the key management server on your network and do that perform that activation. I've not, uh, personally, I've not heard of anybody wanting to run Macs on a, on a virtualized environment because if you run your Mac count out 
I mean, Macs are expensive, and if you run your account out, you have to call Microsoft and, and uh, explain to them what happened, and nobody wants to do that more than once. Uh, so we'll just check on our install. Okay, still going. Are there any questions so far? Yes. The sound part. Right. So, uh, so that's a good question, and that's that's. Uh, I'm going to speak to that in a in a little bit about remote access. Uh, were you using remote desktop or using? And so using remote desktop from a Linux machine. That that might be where you run into trouble. So I I um, I typically use the uh, either FreeRDP or the uh, or the Microsoft Remote Desktop client, and the sound usually carries through. If you're using something like VNC, there's no capability for sound. So if you're if you're using you know if you're logging into your machines via the uh, the Horizon dashboard, there's no there's no capability to to get that sound to you. Uh, it may be in your in your RDB client configuration that for some reason or another sound isn't available. Typically, you'll be able to see if it's a uh, if it's a kind of client side problem or a VM side problem based on whether or not the the sound icon is xed out. Um, and if that's the case, that means you know some something is signaled to the uh, the VM that sound cannot work right now. Uh, if you see that sound icon and you can change the volume and so on, then, then it's probably something client side. Yes? I was actually wondering, uh, you were making an assumption of uh, you know, creating new images. Can you talk a little bit about unique you know, city state taking an existing image and moving over into a new place? I, can, I, I certainly can. Uh, I, don't, I don't have first-hand experience with that. So the question was, uh, the, the, the assumption here is that we're starting off in a virtualized environment. So I'm doing this install to a virtual machine, and I'm going to take that image and import it into to, uh, to Nova. Uh, the question was, uh, can I speak to taking physical images and importing those into a virtual environment, P to, P to V, uh, as it's called? Uh, and uh, what, uh, what's available is something I think called WinPE, which is a, and there may be people in the room actually that have, have much more experience with this than I do, but uh, there, there is a Microsoft tool that you can kind of use as a, a pre-boot uh, environment. So you get your physical machine set up, or maybe it's already been set up for years and years, and, <clears throat> and you, uh, you use this kind of pre-boot tool to, uh, to boot into, and it knows how to Take what you have on your your uh, your physical hard drive, your physical storage, and pull that out as a as a disk image. Uh, and I'm not I'm not sure what the intricacies would be in in trying to take that image and then run it on completely different hardware. I would. Uh, so the so so the advice is to load your your. PV drivers first, uh, and make sure that those are installed so that when you actually do boot it on the on the on the virtual uh, host or as a virtual machine, your devices will actually work. Your specifically, I would guess your hard drive is probably the most important thing that needs to work. Uh, and do you, would you would you happen to know if there are any uh, complications from moving between different kinds of CPU and so on? It's a mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Right. 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 So the, the advice from the audience is to, is to well, that it's, it's a mess. It's hit or miss. Uh, and you may have better luck instead of going straight from physical to virtual into uh, 
in, into uh, Nova if you're running on, on say, KVM, uh, to go through the VMware conversion tool and then from the VMware conversion tool possibly to, uh, to a Nova image. Sorry? The newer, the newer semantic backup tool does a better job is, is the advice there. Uh, so it, uh, it removes your hardware and, and kind of knows how to, I guess, leave Windows in a state that it's, uh, it's going to, you know, instead of assuming it's running on a bunch of stuff that's, that's not there anymore, we'll go ahead and discover what it needs to do. So, uh, so we've we've, I guess we've finished copying all our files to disk and we've rebooted and now we're at the point where, uh, we've got to make a decision, uh, and this decision is is based on those going back to that uh, those two use cases for what you're actually going to do with this image, uh, if you're the operator and you want to make a generalized image that your users can can uh, boot up and then customize completely for their needs, uh, you're going to go in one direction here. Uh, if you're the actual end user and uh, you just want to, uh, well, and then you're not going to be doing that, you just want to shove this thing into Glance, but uh, you know, you're comfortable creating local user accounts and doing these settings before you import it, uh, you take another course. And that course, that's the, the kind of course, uh, if any of you looked at the blog that's described there, where we'd actually create a user account and uh, we'd install the uh, the PV network drive, well, I guess we're gonna do that. We'd create a user account and we'd set up remote desktop and then we'd shut the thing down and then do the import. Uh, we're gonna just go through the first approach now, which is to create a, a more generalized image that we could then turn over to our, our uh, end users and uh, they, can, they can customize it how they want. And because we're doing that, we don't wanna do stuff like create a local user account because that's gonna be lingering in their image when they go and use it. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna do what's called entering audit mode. And to do that, we need to ent enter a special key combination, which is, uh, oops, did I do the wrong one? No, that's not it. We need to enter a special key combination, which I actually can't enter through VNC, so I'm gonna do it with the on-screen keyboard. <coughs> and that, Key combination, I believe, is Control Shift F3. That's right, and thankfully it gets rid of the keyboard because uh, we don't need that anymore. So what that's going to do instead of normally what would have happened there was we would have created a user, and uh, if this was a retail install of. Uh, of Windows, we would have entered a license key, we would have set our time zone, set our, set you know a number of other things, and then gone and uh, and um, opened up uh, remote desktop ports if we wanted to, uh, installed the pair virtualized network driver, and uh, and then shut the thing down and, and pushed it into Glance. Uh, but instead, we're going to enter what's called audit mode which means we kind of skip that user creation process and everything we do, really any kind of customizations we make, uh, unless, we're, unless we're careful, are, are gonna get lost because at the very end of this experience, uh, very end of this process, we're gonna tell Windows, generalize this image, remove the product key if it's a retail key, make it, make it uh, return it back to the kind of shrink wrap state. Uh, and because, <coughs> So I'm going to kind of go back to this tool, this Windows System Image Manager. Uh, <clears throat> what this tool can, can let you do is, uh, again, enable remote desktop, open up firewall ports, and so on. And the end result of that is what they call a, an answer file, which is this XML file that, uh, that has all these custom settings that you've, you've given. And in order to use that file, actually, first, uh, I'm going to go ahead and 
open up the device manager to enable, to uh, install the pair virtualized network driver. It's actually pretty snappy for, for a VM running in Toronto. And we're going to need to browse. That CD is still plugged in there. I happen to know it's on the E drive. And so we found that right away. I was gonna. I was gonna ask that nobody spams my uh, machine, but it's. That's right. It's back in Toronto. So, good luck. So now we have a network driver installed. One of the things that uh, we can tell this tell SysPrep to do in this generalization process is to persist the net persist the drivers and driver settings that we've uh, we've installed. Uh, Incidentally, one of the other things you can you can tell SysPrep to do through this answer file is uh, set your IE homepage to something other than MSN, and not ask you to turn on suggested sites and so on. So that's kind of a that's kind of a bonus. You can get really creative. It's actually really uh, really complicated, really featureful tool. And I'm just waiting for this to load up because I've gone and created a, an answer file that uh, is not is not ideal, but it'll at least work pretty well for the purpose of this demo. And I put it on GitHub so that I can you know, just go ahead and suck it down. Desktop. Yep. So we've uh, we've got our network driver installed. We've got our answer file pulled in, and we're now ready to uh, run SysPrep to generalize this image. Which means the next time that it boots up, it's going to run through that whole out of box experience state again, so that when somebody actually uh, does a Nova boot. Uh, from this image, what they're going to get is, or normally would be, that whole wizard. In my, my answer file, I've changed it so it doesn't ask them you know, 20 questions about time zones or anything like that. But, uh, but it's, it's certainly possible, or in general, this, this sysprep uh, process is how you would do that. help window up so we can see. So SysPrep, if you remember when we first booted up this machine, we were in audit mode. Uh, and so SysPrep came up with that window asking us what, what uh, sort of SysPrep we wanted to do. Because we're going to give it an answer file, we need to run it from the command line. So I'll just, and we're going to generalize it. So this would typically, or it's uh, one of the configuration settings in the answer files, whether or not, whether or not you want it to kind of uh, rearm the system or wipe out the, the activation, any activation status that's, uh, that's uh, been set. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell SysPrep to uh, generalize the image to the next time we boot, we want to go back to the out-of-box experience, OOBE, uh, to shut down when it's done 
uh, sysprepping and to use that answer file that, uh, that I had pulled down. And first we've got to close this. So this will run through that answer file and then do all the sysprepping and eventually this window will die. And while we wait for that, I'll, I'll just go back to the presentation. Um, so I, I promised to talk a bit about storage. Uh, this is kind of the, one of the, you know, the, the good, bad, and ugly parts. This is one of the ugly parts. This is actually a measurement uh, I took this morning. I was curious to know how many, how many IOPS, how many input output operations uh, Windows 7 does when it's booting on a, on a virtual environment. And so this is actually a measurement taken from the compute host. Uh, as Windows 7 is booting, uh, so these are actual operations done to the, the, uh, the storage device on the compute host uh, between the time we said Nova boot and the time that uh, we're actually able to, to log into the machine over remote desktop. Uh, it, it amounts to about 75,000 IOPS, which is, uh, uh, I mean, just to give you kind of an example, your, your typical uh, enterprise class server hard drive, spinny disk, uh, is probably capable of around 400 to 500 IO operations per second. So you'd spend, that hard drive would spend two and a half, yeah, that's right, two and a half minutes uh, doing nothing but helping this little VM boot. Uh, if you've booted Linux instances in Nova, you, you kind of notice they come up really quickly. They don't, they don't take two and a half or three minutes, three minutes in this case, and this is, this is actually with, uh, with an SSD. Uh, so so that's, that's what's known as the bootstorm, I guess. Actually, the bootstorm is commonly when you're booting up a number of these Windows VMs. Uh, so that 75,000 number goes to maybe 750,000 if you're booting 10 of them, or 7.5 million IOPS if you're booting 100 of them. Um, there, there aren't too many mitigation strategies in the, in the OpenStack realm for this. Uh, one is to, I guess there are really four, I've listed three. Uh, one is to just buy lots of, lots of very fast storage. The second is to boot your VMs very rarely, uh, or, or just, you know, don't boot so many, I guess would be option four. Uh, the third is, is to use something uh, like uh, live images. So if, if you've, I don't want to make this a sales pitch for what we do, uh, but uh, so I've just got one slide and I'll go through it real quick. Uh, what we do is we, we allow you to take a kind of a whole system state snapshot at the, uh, at the login screen or at the, you know, at whatever point the VM's ready to do work. And then you can, uh, when you need new VMs, you can spin those up from that snapshot, from that live image, and they just go ready, uh, direct to uh, working. Uh, and I can, I can answer questions about that later, or you can go by our booth. I encourage that. <coughs> sure. Yeah. So, so the the idea behind uh, the idea behind live images or the the snapshotting thing is that this is for more short-lived VMs, and you typically be doing your your uh, Windows updates kind of before you create the snapshot, and then maybe do that every Friday or every time every time you need to. Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, uh, a lot of that time. So, so it still took. It still takes even on an SSD on our hardware, which is which is pretty decent. Uh, it still takes about three minutes to boot that, and our SSDs are capable of much more than 500 IOPS. Uh, so, you know, you can. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to play it. I guess it depends on how how much time you have and how much money. Um, but uh, typically, if you have SSDs, they're not going to be saturated by a uh, by a boot. There will be, you know, the Windows will be using the SSD at times when it's booting, but for the most part, it'll be uh, it'll be pretty free. Um, 
So I was going to talk a bit about uh, integration with ID. I mean, we don't, we don't, uh, we just give the compute node SSDs and we just let it figure out what to what to schedule. Um, so, so AD integration with, oh, actually, I guess we can go back to that VM, uh, or actually that, that VM is now uh, shut down and, and ready to be imported. So I'm gonna go ahead and add it to glance. Uh, so this, this we're, we're at the point basically with that image where it's, I mean, we're ready to put it into Nova and tell our users, Hey, you need Windows boot from this disk image. So that's pretty cool. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll go into a little bit about uh, Active Directory. Uh, so you can actually set up and an, uh, you can set up unattended joins in Active Dire for Active Directory as part of your uh, your uh, kind of generalization specialization process. You can do that with the unattended XML file. The problem there is that typically your Active Directory uh, machines need to have unique machine names, which means you, ne you actually need to bring them up, change the name, and then uh, and do the domain join and then reboot them again. Um, I guess I should back up a bit. I mean, kind of one of the one of the things that's important to realize is that when we stuff this image in, in Glance, uh, it either has no machine name, it ha it has no computer name in the case uh, of this generalized uh, image that we've put in, or it's got whatever computer, whatever name you've given it if you've gone through that kind of uh, more specialized approach. Uh, you can use stuff like Cloud-based init to actually uh, use, uh, use metadata at boot time to tell the VM, hey, uh, this is gonna be your unique machine name and here are your, your, uh, your Active Directory credentials uh, but uh, the important thing to the important thing is that you're probably looking at a at, a, at another reboot. Uh, the the actual plumbing of the uh, of the Active Directory server stuff, uh, you you essentially just need to make it so that the VMs are able to resolve and and contact your LDAP server. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, right, right. I mean, specifically, specifically. So, in order to contact the DC, uh, I mean, there are two separate issues that can come up. One is that they won't actually be able to route to the route to whatever port they need to on the DC, and the second is that they won't actually be able to resolve the DC because they're. Uh, and this, this issue is the same issue with key management servers as well, that, uh, that Windows has, has a special way of figuring out what are the addresses of the services that it needs to contact. And so it, it uh, looks for these special DNS entries. They're called these serve records. Uh, we've had to, in, in some cases, we've had to put the, uh, the serve records, we've had to kind of replicate the serve records in our DNS mask, uh, Configuration files in the cases where in the cases where uh, the VMs were using different kind of upstream DNS providers or different upstream DNS servers uh, for the plumbing part it, it does get tricky and it does depend on the the configuration uh, I mean if you yeah, in general, you need to, you'll need to have some kind of tunneling, or or you know potentially use something like uh, Quantum to to provide some kind of routable network so that uh, the uh, you know the VMs are able to do that, able to to make those connections to the the uh, the DC. Uh, we uh, we haven't actually had a use case for that yet. Yeah. yeah the question was: Have we have we used uh, have we had success using floating floating IPs with the system? Um, and 
uh, we haven't we haven't quite had any use case for that yet. Um, so I think we can. Okay, so we've got our uh, image imported, and we can actually see it in Glance now. And I'll just bring this up for the first time. That'll take, that'll take about three minutes until uh, all in all. I don't know. Uh, so on the topic of remote access, <coughs> there's not really anything available like, uh, I mean, Zen Desktop, Citrix Zen Desktop doesn't, doesn't really support, does not support uh, OpenStack. Uh, VMware View doesn't support OpenStack. Uh, so you're kind of left to more, uh, I guess, less less enterprise-oriented solutions. They they kind of default uh, default solution is to just use the VNC console in in Horizon, or to uh, to otherwise pipe a VNC session through to the compute node, and use VNC. Uh, VNC is kind of a well, I don't want to I don't know how to phrase this. Uh, there are probably better protocols out there. Uh, and I mean, even just the, the RDP server that, uh, that comes with Windows, is actually a you know, much better protocol in terms of uh, optimizing transmission and being able to route stuff like sound and, uh, and so on. Uh, there are also some other uh, kind of open um, access protocols out there uh, that uh, I would say the most the, that in most widespread use is, is RDP, and com, I mean especially when you're running Windows in a kind of a cloud environment, uh, the uh, I would say probably the the niftiest solution is to run something like free RDP's uh, HTML5 uh, RDP client, so you can set up your Windows instances and then you can have a you know another VM running this uh, this kind of RDP portal. And then all you need to do is point a web browser to it to actually log in. And you know, it'll do the plumbing on the back end. So again, uh, this, is, this is again with reasonably fast hardware, but uh, still, I, I've, I've clocked it a few times and it takes about 180 seconds. Are there any, uh, any questions so far? Yeah. Right. Right. Is there a reason why? Uh, it's it's uh, it's widely regarded. So the question was, why did uh, earlier when I installed the pair virtualization drivers, why was it the Red Hat pair virtualization driver? Uh, it's 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 pretty widely regarded as being a stable PV driver, a stable uh, pair virtualized driver or that, that pair, the storage and the network driver. Uh, we, we have to install it because we're giving the VM, uh, we're not giving the VM emulated hardware. We're not, we're not kind of plugging in these devices that are acting like network cards or storage devices. Uh, we're giving them, we're kind of exposing a more raw para-virtualized interface to them. So para-virtualized means that uh, that the operating system kind of knows that it's a virtualized device, that it's not an actual real piece of hardware, so it's not going to do, you know, all the initialization and, and stuff that it would do. Uh, so it's you know it's it's not fake hardware. It's not it's nothing that actually looks like hardware. It's just a kind of defined interface. And when we installed those drivers in the VM, what we were doing was giving the operating system a way of talking to that defined interface. That's right. That's right. All that part is abstracted out because that network driver that we gave it is just a piece of software. And on the other side, on the actual Nova 
OpenStack, Nova, KVM side of things, we also know it's just a piece of software. And we're going to, you know, the, the hypervisor is going to take care of making use of, uh, of, of kind of taking whatever traffic comes out or whatever disk requests that come out of that and doing the appropriate thing with them. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for the most part, no. And in fact, you'd use those same, you'd use those same Windows Seven uh, drivers. Yeah, yeah. Windows Seven, Windows Seven, and, and two thousand eight are, are very similar in terms of uh, operating in a uh, in, a, in an OpenStack environment. Yeah. But, So our VM is ostensibly up, and we'll just go ahead and log in. So the single, single dialog that we still have to do is choose the network type. <clears throat> and we now have a Windows instance uh, running in OpenStack. Uh, I'm going to just open it up to questions. That's, that's really all I had for, uh, for this session. So if there are any questions from the crowd. Uh, so one of, the things I, one of the things I plugged into that, that uh, answer file was an administrative password. So you can do that. Uh, and the alternative would have been uh, if we wanted to let the user set that up, that uh, whoever can log into the VNC console would just go and go through that create user account process uh, that would normally come up. So in this case, as I, as I said, we wouldn't use this the answer file that I used in, in production for reasons like that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, yeah. Uh, this image, this image. Let me bring it back here. So this image, we can we can reboot it. We can, uh, you know, some of the things we can do actually through RDP, we can't reboot it. But if we went into the VNC console, uh, we could reboot it. Or if we issued the appropriate PowerShell command. Yeah. So, uh, so the. So the question is, if I reboot this instance, will you know, if I make changes to this instance and then I reboot it, say because I ran Windows Update, would those changes be lost? Uh, the answer is no. You can you can make changes to this image. You can reboot it as many times as you want. the The only thing is that if you Nova delete the image, then you will lose the changes. So if we go and actually, if we go to Nova and say delete this server, delete this VM, then we'll lose everything we've done. Uh, one of the things you can do that that seems to work is create a create a disk image from this VM uh, using the Nova image create command, and that'll that'll attempt to create an, an image containing all the changes we made that we can then boot other machines off of later. Windows 8 and Windows 2012, yeah, in general, yeah, we've. we've Works, yeah, and the PV drivers are already available for those as well, so you can run run through basically the same process. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll take your question. Uh, so. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, if you'd set the machine up exactly as I have, what I would the first thing I would probably do is change the administrator password or disable the administrator account and start creating uh, users through that. Uh, the, there's a snap in that you can go and create new users and, and so on from. Did you automate any of that from, from the dashboard down to the OS? How do I get that user into the 
So there is, there is also, if you use uh, the cloud base in it, um, they do have, cre they have user creation functionality, but I believe, there, I believe it's only one user you can create, and I'm not sure if, well, I, could, okay, I guess you can actually uh, choose which local group to put them in, so you can define an administrator user. And then when you boot the machine, uh, the, so Nova creates a, an admin password for, for every VM. Uh, it'll it'll plug that in, and the uh, cloud base in it'll be able to take that and uh, insert that password as that user's password. Uh, yeah, I mean everything else. You're probably looking at something like custom scripts to do that, or right, 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 <clears throat> right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'll be putting those up. I think there's going to be a, a slide share for all the presentations here at the summit. At least there was last summit. And so those will be, those will be up, I would guess, later on this afternoon or tomorrow. And I'll, I'll definitely, and I, I have some references and, and links to some other. Uh, the question was where, when, how, to get, how to get the slides. Uh, these will be uploaded, I think, to the, the summit-wide slide deck repository later. Absolutely. So if you, if you don't want to type all this in, you can just go to gridcentric.com slash blog, and it's the first entry. Sorry, you had a question as well. I just want to see your contact info. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm uh, Tim Smith. Oops. And let me throw that up bigger. You can, uh, you know, you can email me or tweet me. Uh, we've got a booth. I guess today's the last day of the summit, and I think the uh, the hall's about to the house, uh, the expo hall's going to close at two. But we do have a booth there if you want to come by and ask us more. Uh, the cloud base guys are right around the corner from us, so uh, you can ask them about uh, cloud base in it and, and many other things as well. Any any more questions? Yes. So that was something I had meant to ask the Cloud Base Init guys before the talk, and I just didn't have time. Whether So the question was, have I tried to use Cloud Base Init with SysPrep? Uh, I'm going to guess that there is a way to construct an answer file such that, at the very least, it will install Cloud Base Init. Uh, I don't know if you just installed Cloud, if we installed it during that audit mode step, uh, would it actually persist, and would the would the appropriate keys persist to the next reboot? But I, I would imagine the answer is that there is definitely some way to do that. Exactly. So this is this is one of the uh, this is one of the kind of issues with the generalize uh, is that at some point you need to kind of bring it up and then change the name and then join the domain and go through another reboot and so on, yeah. Sorry? At least three reboots? Yeah. Apparently, there are, there are ways to hack it so that you don't have to, or so you can kind of consolidate, consolidate that into one reboot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, side we haven't personally. Uh, but it's uh, but the so the cloud based guys that's their specialty. If you're trying to run if you're trying to run OpenStack on Hyper V, uh, they they know all the nuts and bolts of that. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, I think we'll pack up. Oh yeah. If I have any thoughts about OpenStack and Windows HPC, uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, typically HPC users aren't, aren't very fond of virtualization in general. That's been my experience, at least. I know that, that that's kind of changing. Uh, if the use case is we want to use OpenStack to be able to spin up quickly uh, Windows, Windows HPC instances, 
Uh, it's not going to be the quickest thing in the world, but I guess it would be faster than installing them on bare metal. So that would that would probably be a use case for this. And uh, as far as I know, the the you know the the kind of uh, general installation process for HPC, the drivers, and so on and so forth would would go about exactly the same. The the one shortcoming uh, right now is that it's hard to get uh, kind of um, virtualization aware hardware plumbed up to the the VM layer right now in OpenStack. And I don't know if that's something that's being actively worked on, but for example, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're running HPC applications on virtualization, you want to you want to take advantage of the SRIOV stuff in your network card or your InfiniBand card. And that's not really as far as I know, that's not really a, a supported use case right now. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pack up and head to lunch. Thanks for coming, guys.